<laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started this morning. Our Father, we are grateful for this beautiful day you've given us to serve you. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the great weekend that we've had. Thank you, Lord, for the services yesterday, the great preaching and, and uh, the good attendance and the, those that trusted Christ as their Savior and were added to the church through the, through the uh, baptism. And I pray, Father, that you'll bless those folks this week as they begin their new life in Christ. Father, we pray that you'll bless uh, our people today as we uh, get started on this, uh, this new week. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to focus on that which we need to accomplish here this morning in this class. Bless throughout the morning, throughout the day, and all of our activities. Father, may we uh, honor you in all that we do. And We pray for the Harvey family today as, as we have the funeral for Mrs. Harvey's mother. I pray, Lord, that, that will be a, a precious time for the family and for our church family. Father, bless those folks today, and I pray, Lord, that you'll uh, comfort their hearts as only you can uh, during their time of loss. Bless now during this session, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'll remind you of a couple things here, then we'll get right on into our notes this morning. Um, memory work this week on Wednesday, as usual, we're down to, what's it look like here? Week number 12 on your list. A couple of familiar verses, I'm sure. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, and also 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. So be ready to go with that next time we meet together, first thing. Also remind you that your final workbook assignment is coming due on May the 4th, which is the end of next week. We're about to run out of April in a hurry here. And so uh, May the 4th, that's a week from Friday, workbook number three will be due. And, uh, and again, you can turn that in any time between now and then, but that will be the, uh, the ultimate deadline. Also, uh, you should, uh, should have received back the test that you took on Friday uh, last week in this class, and if you haven't checked your boxes this morning it should be there for you and uh, most of the class did very well so praise the Lord one more to go amen that's the one we call the final exam so <clears throat> and uh, the good news is, is in my classes the final counts the same as all of, all the other tests that are uh, they're not uh, uh, you know it just kind of goes back to where we where we stopped on the last one and so the final exam will cover the material that we're dealing with now on the doctrine of Jesus Christ all right <clears throat> Let's go back to where we left off last time. We're still talking about the uh, preciousness of Christ, and this is just kind of the introduction into the lessons we'll deal with. Our primary thrust this morning is going to be uh, to be beginning a lesson on the uh, eternal preexistence of Christ. And uh, I've got a handful of you fellows in here that uh, are taking the Life of Christ class right now, so you've already got a leg up on the other folks here when it comes to some of the stuff we're going to deal with in the next session or two. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, cover some things that we don't cover in Life of Christ. And then uh, I'm trying to remember uh, part of the notes that I, that I teach you in the Life of Christ class come, uh, came from, the, from the, uh, the backbone of these notes because I've taught, life, uh, taught Bible doctrine several times before I... Uh, finally began teaching Life of Christ, and Life of Christ is a class that we teach usually about every other year, and so, uh, of course, Bible doctrines we teach every year, so some of you will get a chance to hear that again, and maybe you can get it right in your notes this time, what do you think, huh? So, <laughs> that's the plan, anyway. All right, talking about the preciousness of Christ, we said that Christ, of course, is precious to the sacred writers. Our emphasis this morning, uh, as we finish up this introduction, is that secondly, Christ, of course, is precious to the believer. Christ is precious to the believer. He is precious to those who have put their faith and trust in him because they're the only ones who truly know him. They're the only ones that truly have a personal relationship with him. And uh, I think we just uh, briefly talked about this last time. Let's go back and go over it again if we didn't and, uh, and write it down this time especially. The Christian loves the Lord for two basic reasons. Write it down. The Christian loves the Lord for two basic reasons. The Christian loves the Lord for two basic reasons. First of all, because of who he is. Because of who he is. And secondly, because of what he has done for us. We love the Lord because of who he is and because of what he has done for us. 
what the Lord was willing to do for us is, of course, that which first attracts us to Him. Then after we are saved, we have an, an ever-increasing desire to learn more and more about the one who did so much for us. And he certainly becomes more precious to us every day. And so this is the, uh, the same order, the same progression that we find in Scripture. And, uh, for example, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. And we'll kick it off there this morning. Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> The first part of this passage, of course, we're quite familiar with, I'm sure, and we'll look at that because it is uh, such an important portion of Scripture and it is so precious to us as it describes what the Lord did for us. And then we'll touch on uh, some additional verses out of this passage that maybe aren't quite as familiar to you. But uh, as I said, you know, we love the Lord because of who He is. We love the Lord because of what He's done for us. And, uh, and that's the same order, the same progression that we find in Scripture. For instance, here in Philippians chapter 2, in this memorable passage, the Apostle Paul first shows a love of what Christ did for him and, uh, and did for us. Of course, in Philippians chapter 2, pick it up in the familiar verse, verse number 5, where Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And uh, here we see that, that Paul writes about his consuming desire to know the Lord better. And uh, Paul loved the Lord for what Christ had done for him. But he is also... Uh, taken up and consumed with the love, with love for the person of Christ Himself, and we see that here in that in those verses uh, that we read, the latter part of that, verses eight through eleven. Take special note of, uh, uh, of as we get into uh, uh, chapter three. Uh, I want you to take note of. Uh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong reference there. I've already read chapter two. Let's go to chapter three and let's look at verses eight through eleven in chapter three. As Paul now, of course, uh, deals with the love that he has for the Lord uh, himself in verses 8 through 11, chapter 3. He says in verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now notice verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain my, unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, here we see that, uh, that Paul uh, focuses, of course, upon his daily walk, his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to take special note of that statement found in verse number 10, that I may know him, that I may know him. In the brief period of time that we have left in this semester, we're going to do a quick overview of the, of the person and work of the Lord Jesus and we don't have time to go into a lot of depth. We'll uh, touch on as much as we can. We'll at least hit the highlights. And, and as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, all of you eventually, I suppose, will have the opportunity to, uh, to take the Life of Christ class where we go into some of these thoughts in, in a, little better, a little greater detail than we'll have time to deal with here. But the first portion of this study is, is uh, of this history of Christ is his eternal preexistence. So go ahead and mark your notes accordingly. His eternal 
pre-existence. His eternal pre-existence. Now the word actually means to live, write it down, the word pre-existence actually means to live before birth. To live before birth. As you know, of course, uh, the little uh, prefix pre means before. So we're saying that Christ existed before he was born in Bethlehem. Most studies of the life of Christ, of course, start at at Bethlehem, but that's only part of the story because the Lord Jesus is unlike any other man who ever lived upon this earth for a number of reasons, and one of them is the fact that Christ lived before he was born on the earth. So a proper study of the doctrine of Jesus Christ must begin with his existence long before even this world came into being. Now, this doctrine is best expressed. Let's go to John chapter 1 because this is the best place, the classic passage that deals with uh, the pre-existence of Christ. There are other places in the Bible that speak of it. And, uh, for example, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. What's the scripture say there? It says, write it down, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And that's in reference, of course, to the immutability of God, isn't it? Jesus is the same all the time. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is eternal. Uh, and so uh, we, we have a, a, a number of passages that come to mind, and we'll deal with some of them here in our study, about the eternal preexistence of Christ. And, of course, the doctrine perhaps is best expressed in this passage, John chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And again, this is a familiar portion to us. Let's look at it together. Get your Bibles open if you haven't already. And let's take a look at it. <clears throat> John chapter 1, picking it up, verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so here we have it. What an amazing truth that God became man. It's amazing also to consider the, the simplicity the scripture uses in expressing such, a, such an unfathomable uh, doctrine. You know, you stop and think about it. You go back to uh, the story of creation. You go back to the first chapter or two of Genesis. And, uh, you know, and God put all that together in, in such a concise, succinct way. Uh, of course, as the Holy Spirit is the author of all the scriptures. Yes, God used uh, human instruments to put it down on paper. But, but the Holy Spirit is the author of the scripture. And uh, if man had been telling that story, we wouldn't be able to carry the books in here in a truck, you know, of creation. But, uh, and the same thing's true, true here of this passage and so many others, of course, where the Lord uh, in such simple uh, terms describes such a, an amazing truth. Here we see that in the beginning, in other words, when everything else began, in the beginning was, the Lord already was, in the beginning was the Word. 
as we read, the first chapter of John clearly tells us, of course, in verse 14, that the Word is Christ. So John is saying that in the beginning, when all things began, Christ already was. Now, you remember the memory verse that you wrote down last week, John chapter 8 and verse number 58. Look over there and let's get that down again and, uh, and, and include it in your notes here. Take just a moment to plug that in, John chapter 8. And verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. All right, that's a further illustration of, the, of what we're talking about here this morning, the eternal preexistence of Christ. Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. That's what I want you to put into your notes there, at least that part. Before Abraham was, I am. In this portion of Scripture, the Lord is answering a question concerning his age and concerning his identity, and he responds with that statement, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, why did he say that? Abraham lived 2,000 years, at least, before Christ came to this earth. Furthermore, why didn't Jesus say what we might have said? Before Abraham was, I was. <laughs> He didn't say that because he was speaking of his eternal preexistence, his eternal existence. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He never had a beginning, and he will never have an ending. He lives beyond the realm of time. With Christ, there is no past. With Christ, there is no future. And in the sense of eternity, he is eternal. He is from everlasting to everlasting. So not only was Christ referring to his eternal existence, when he said here in John chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am, not only was he talking about his eternal existence, he was also, uh, of course, claiming to be God. As you remember, of course, I am is a name of God. Remember what the Lord told Moses in Exodus chapter 3, uh, around verse 14 or so. God told Moses to tell the people of Israel when he went to Egypt uh, so that they would believe God had sent them had sent him, God told Moses, tell the people of Israel that I am had sent him. They'd get the message then because I am is a name for God. So the scriptures plainly teach that Christ has always existed. Now I want to consider three important thoughts concerning Christ's preexistence. We'll cover this in three sections here. The first part is number one, what we call the fact of his preexistence. The fact of his preexistence. And we'll go right back to John chapter 1 on this, uh, as well as some other spots as, uh, along the way. <clears throat> the fact of his preexistence. The fact of his preexistence is stated in the words, in the beginning was the Word. In other words, before the world was ever created, before time itself began, Christ existed. Now that is of utmost importance to you and I as Christians. Consider 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 11 and 12. Hold your place here. We'll keep coming back to it uh, in, in the Gospel of John. But turn over to 1 John chapter 5 with me. And we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> Some tremendous truths taught to us here in this portion of scripture. 1 John chapter 5, pick it up with me in verse 11. Here is John the apostle writes and he says, and this is the record that God hath given to us look at the next two words, eternal life. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All right, so there's no middle ground. We're not on our way to being saved. We're saved or we're lost today, amen? We're on our way to heaven or we're on our way to hell. There's no in-between. There's no middle ground there. You're saved or you're lost. You have the Son or you don't. And so this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. In these verses, we see that a person who trusts Christ has life. What kind of life is it referring to? Well, it says right there, eternal life. Now go with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And let's look at verse number 4. 
Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 4. <clears throat> Rather short verse, but it really nails it as to what we're talking about this morning. When Christ, Colossians 3 verse 4, when Christ, look at the next little phrase, when Christ who is our life, write it down, Colossians 3 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Get the first part of that in your notes. When Christ, who is our life. In this verse, we see that Christ is our life. He is my life. He is your life. Therefore, we know what kind of life we have. Eternal, for he is eternal. All right, now let's go back a few pages to Colossians, or Galatians rather. Galatians chapter 2, end of chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. You'll recognize these words if you don't recognize the reference already. Consider <coughs> the precious truth of Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, and we'll park on this one here just for a little bit. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul says we are crucified with Christ. What does that mean? That means that we are to be uh, dead to self. Amen? The life that we live is to be fully surrendered unto the Lord in such a way that the life that we live is really not ours, it is Christ living through us. He says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When we accepted Christ as our personal Savior and placed our faith and trust in Him, uh, we were born again. And in a, in a very real sense, we began living a new life. Amen? Now, I was born into this world on June 17, 1951, I happened to be born on Father's Day. That's the best deal my dad ever got, amen? And uh, I'm sure there's another view out there on that too, but anyway. I was born into this world on June 17, 1951. I was born again on June 16, 1967. I got saved the day before my 16th birthday. So I celebrate my birthdays twice a year, back to back, one day after another, Amen. And uh, when we trusted Christ, the life we now live is not our own. It is Christ living in us. So the life we now live, as Paul says here, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what's all that mean? It means that once we are saved, we possess an eternal salvation. Amen? Amen. Now, as Baptists, we sometimes use that little phrase, once saved, always saved. That's talking about the same thing. It's talking about the fact that we possess an eternal salvation. And uh, nothing can ever change that because keeping our, ourselves saved is God's business, not ours. Amen. It's in God's hands, not ours. Thank the Lord for that. I can remember a, a number of occasions out on visitation when I've had people get upset with me and, and tell me in no uncertain terms uh, where to go. <laughs> and they were thinking about a particular place that they had in mind that starts with the letter H. And they weren't thinking about heaven either. But when I, when I was a, a young Christian, that used to really bother me, you know. And, and I'm sure it always will to some degree. But I got to thinking about that. And, uh, and one day I told uh, one of those people, when they made that statement to me that I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. It was impossible because once I had trusted Christ as my Savior, he took up residence in my heart, and I could, I could not ever go to hell unless one of two things happened. And uh, the first is if he died, and of course that can't happen because he's eternal from everlasting to everlasting. And secondly, the only way I could ever go to hell is if he leaves me. And, of course, that's never going to happen either because according to Hebrews 13.5, the Bible says, For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we see that the fact of Christ's preexistence means, you want to write this down, the fact, as we conclude this section, the fact of Christ's preexistence means that I am always saved. The fact of Christ's preexistence means that I am always saved. There's a lot of other reasons I know I'm saved. That's a good one right there, amen? 
fact of Christ's preexistence means that I am always saved. That brings us to the second part of our discussion here, and we'll probably be on this part throughout the rest of the session this morning. That is, secondly, the form of his preexistence, the form of his preexistence. Now, we're going to go back to John chapter 1 uh, here in just a moment. The form of his preexistence. Now, if you ever really got into a discussion, and I don't recommend that you do, but if you ever really get into a discussion on this particular thought, the eternal preexistence of Christ with a Jehovah's Witness, they would tell you in so many words that they believe what you believe. They would tell you in so many words that they believe in the preexistence of Jesus Christ. But they would not be using the same uh, meaning. They would not be using that terminology in the same sense that we are or, or with the same definition or the same meaning. You see, they believe that Jesus is a created being. They believe that Jesus was created, just like you and I were created, just like the angels were created. And a created being uh, does not live beyond the realm of time because a created being has a starting point, has a beginning point. Uh, and, and, of course, the Lord is uh, forevermore. So they do not believe that he existed as a real person before uh, his incarnation in Bethlehem. And, uh, in fact, they deny the deity of Christ, and that certainly means that they do not believe that he is God. He existed, they say, but only as an idea in God's mind. So inasmuch that God has always known what he was eventually going to do with Jesus, and since God will always remember what he did with Jesus, in that sense, according to them, Christ is eternal, everlasting. Of course, that is not a biblical point of view, to say the least. A close look at John chapter 1 not only reveals that Christ pre-existed his birth in Bethlehem, it will also reveal to us the exact form in which we find him before the ages began. All right, so our first point was the fact of his pre-existence. Now we're talking about the form of his pre-existence, so don't get, uh, don't get our phrases mixed up here come test time. What I want to give you now is four facts <laughs> about the form of his pre-existence that are found in John chapter 1. Four facts about the form of Christ's preexistence that are found in John chapter 1. Four facts about the form of Christ's preexistence that are found in John chapter 1. All right, the first one, <clears throat> right out of the first verse, is that he was with God. He was with God. Now, here's the importance of that statement. I'm going to give you uh, the, the four facts, and then I'll give you a uh, significance of that type statement. And so get this down. Come test time. You'll need to know these things, I'm sure. He was with God's number one on our list. Here's the significance or the importance of that statement. Write it down. Christ is not some force or concept or idea as the modernists would like for us to believe. Christ is not some force or concept or idea. He is a person. Christ is not some force or concept or idea. He is a person. And therefore, we can have a personal relationship with him. There it is. He is a person. And therefore, we can have a personal relationship with him. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that wonderful? Can you consider that? God is not so far away that, that he's beyond our reach. God is not so far away that he cannot hear our prayers, that he cannot help us bear our burdens. And uh, no, we can have a personal relationship with him. And, uh, and, and of course, the, the world per se out there, even so-called Christianity uh, in, in this modernistic world in which we live, uh, you know, they, the devil deceives so many of them, even in the, with the guise of religion. And uh, people don't need religion. People need what we're talking about right here. People need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so number one, he was with God. Number two, he was God. He was God. Here again, we see the truth of the verse we read a little while ago in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. The last three words of that verse, speaking of Jesus, say, 
equal with God. That brings again uh, to mind, of course, what we've studied in recent weeks, the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, <clears throat> what is the importance of the fact that Christ is God? Very simply, uh, it is the very basis of our faith and trust. What is the importance of this fact that Christ is God? It is the very foundation, the very basis of our faith and trust. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, think about that for a minute. If Christ were only a man, then we could not trust him for salvation, could we? I don't know about you, but my experience in life has been that men fail. Men will let you down. Men will disappoint you. And I'm speaking generically of men and women in that regard. Amen? <laughs> and uh, Because we are not without sin as Jesus was. We, we cannot possess the, the foreknowledge to, to uh, see what's coming down the line. We may make a commitment to someone, and then circumstances keep us from holding to that commitment. We may uh, plan to do something, and then because of our human frailties, we fail to follow through. And uh, people will disappoint you. And uh, I don't care who it is. You follow anybody around long enough, sooner or later you'll be disappointed. That's just reality, isn't it? But not with Jesus. You'll never be disappointed with him, amen, yeah. because he is God. We can trust him without the slightest doubt. So that's the importance of the fact that Christ is God. That is the very foundation, the very basis of our faith and trust. Number three. It's a statement uh, in verse number three, all things were made by him. Now, we're going to spend a little time on this one. All things were made by him. Verse number three tells us the important fact that Christ created all things. Now, this we're going to follow a, a, a little of a progression of thought here, so stay with me. Let's begin with that statement. Verse three tells us that the important fact tells us the important fact that Christ created all things. The obvious conclusion then is that if he created all, he existed before all was created. Now that's not exactly profound, but it is very, very important. The obvious conclusion then is that if he created all, he existed before all was created. The obvious conclusion, if he created all, then he existed before all was created. And then get this statement. If he created all, then he was never created, but always existed. That pretty well shoots holes in the Jehovah's Witness doctrine in a hurry, doesn't it? If he created all, then he was never created, but always existed. If he created all, then he was never created but always existed. All right, so here's the third fact about the form of Christ's preexistence. He is the creator. All things were made by him. Why is that significant? Why is that important? All right, get this down. It's important because it destroys the theories, the theory of evolution and the religion of humanism. It's important because it destroys the theory of evolution and the religion of humanism. Do you know that evolution is a theory based on the religion of humanism? Now, I realize in the government schools it's taught as fact, but it is a theory. It's never been proven, never will be proven. And uh, it's a theory based upon the religion of humanism. It surely is. You say, well, what is humanism? Humanism, write it down, humanism says that man is the basis of all things. Humanism says that man is the basis of all things and is therefore the center of the universe. Well, I've met some folks like that. They think they're the center of the universe, amen? But I'm not talking just about that in terms of personality and so forth. Uh, we're talking about focusing upon man instead upon, of upon God. Humanism says that man is the basis of all things and is therefore the center of the, human, of, of the universe. All right, next statement. Humanism denies the existence of any God other than mind and matter. 
Humanism denies the existence of any God other than mind and matter. Humanism denies the existence of any God other than mind and matter. And then here's the clincher. Then they make a God out of that belief. Then they make a God out of that belief. Essentially that since there is nothing else, then man is his own God. Then they make a God out of that belief, essentially, that since there is nothing else, then man is his own God. Then they make a God out of that belief, essentially, that since there is nothing else, then man is his own God. Now let me back up and cover all that for you one more time here. Humanism says that man is the basis <clears throat> of all things and is therefore the center of the universe. <clears throat> Humanism denies the existence of any God other than mind and matter. Then they make a God out of that belief, essentially since that since there is nothing else, then man is his own God. According to the humanist, matter has always existed and has evolved into what we find in the world today, including man himself. And, uh, of course, nothing could be further from the truth or any more ridiculous than that. In fact, if the results of such beliefs were not so devastating when it comes to eternity, it would almost be funny that so-called educated, so-called intelligent man would hold on to such an unintelligent theory. But here we see a little bit of insight into human nature. Human nature does not like to be held accountable. Something goes wrong, you know, it wasn't my fault. Here's what happened. It was his fault. It was her fault. It was this circumstance. It was that circumstance. Just go back to the Garden of Eden for the first instance of that. Uh, Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed Eve. Before it was all over with, Adam blamed God. <laughs> go back and read it. See it for yourself. Uh, a lack of personal accountability. We, uh, we you know, we, uh, we deal with that all the time here at the college. And... Uh, this last year or so, Brother Brown has put great emphasis upon this business of personal accountability. What's that all about? It's fighting human nature. It's fighting the sin nature, amen? And, uh, and so uh, if the results of, 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 of those beliefs were not so, as I said, so devastating when it comes to eternity, it would be laughable. But it's not laughable when you think about people going to hell because they bought into that junk. And, uh, you know, the whole thought is, it comes back to that, that the, the natural man will grasp a hold of anything, be it the theory of evolution or humanism or whatever ism you want to plug in to say, this is right, Christians are wrong, the Bible's wrong, I don't have to listen to that, I don't have to have anybody telling me how to live my life. Well, the Bible's still true. It's pointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. Now, humanism is very easily defined. Write it down. Humanism is essentially a man-made attempt to elevate man above God. That's probably the simplest definition of humanism that I can give you. A man-made attempt to elevate man above God. Many, many years ago, there was a fellow who was a, uh, a German humanist. His name was George Hegel, H-E-G-E-L, George Hegel. And uh, the well-known German humanist philosopher George Hegel said, and I want you to get this quote down in your notes, Hegel, uh, if you want that background, German humanist philosopher, George Hegel. He spelled his name like you would think of George without an E on the end, G-E-O-R-G, -E George Hegel. He said, man's laws are superior to God's laws. Man's laws are superior to God's laws. Now that strikes at the very heart of humanism because that simple statement is the very essence of humanism. It's the idea that man is supreme over God. And uh, you say, well, we, as Christians, we reject that. I agree. But unfortunately, we often live our lives like a humanist. We live our lives like our ways are better than God's ways. I know more than God knows. 
And uh, I know what God's word says about it, but I'm going to do my thing anyway, and I'm going to be an exception to the rule. Well, there are no exceptions to the rules. Heard some good preaching on that over the weekend, didn't we? And uh, human philosopher uh, Hegel said, man's laws are superior to God's laws. His statement is the very essence of humanism. It is the idea that man is supreme over God. Now, we touched on this a moment ago. If you want to go back to the first attempt that was ever made upon this planet to elevate humans above God, just go back to Genesis, go back to the Garden of Eden where Satan persuaded Eve uh, to eat of the forbidden fruit. Satan told her in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, what he was selling her was the idea that she would be out from under the authority of God. She would be independent of God, doing things her way, instead of God's way. Doing things man's way, that's humanism, is the oldest struggle known to man. And humanism, as we see here, was the basis of the first sin on planet Earth. And it continues today as the struggle uh, of who has the final authority, man or God, whose will will prevail. You realize that the day that you got saved, the day that I got saved, that the very act of conversion to Christ is a surrender of our will to God's will. Getting saved, surrendering one's will to God's totally contradicts humanism. And uh, I got a book in my office that goes into a lot of detail. It's a, a book that we used to use for our class uh, here at the college on the philosophy of Christian education. It's out of print now and I wish it was still available. But it uh, goes into some detail there and it, and it uh, says this about the uh, the humanist and the Christian, talking about some things that we can kind of hang our hat on and remember. It says that the theme song of the humanist is, I did it my way. Now, some of you are going to be way too young to remember Frank Sinatra and some of that crowd many years ago. Not that he was ever one of my heroes. In fact, he even precedes me somewhat. But but uh, he, he and, uh, and, of course, Elvis also, I think, has some success with that one. So... And uh, I did it my way. You know, there was a thing on TV the other day about that nutcase uh, actor, uh, John Travolta. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about? He made a statement that, uh, that he is as famous as Elvis ever was. And uh, I was listening to, to a, a talk show the other day, and a guy said, yeah, Elvis Gerbach. Huh? Elvis Gerbach used to play quarterback for the Chiefs, but you, so you don't want to know who that's all about. But anyway... <laughs> <clears throat> the theme song of the humanist is, I did it my way. The theme song of the Christian is, I surrender all. Big difference in the two, to say the least. All right, now that brings us back to John chapter 1. The fourth fact, the final fact about the form of Christ's preexistence is found in verse number 4 in that statement where it says that, that he was, that he, we'll, we'll rephrase it, he is the light of men. He is the light of men. Verse number 4. He is the light of men. The Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world in John chapter 8 and verse number 12. It also says the same thing in John chapter 9 and verse number 5, that Jesus is the light of the world. You know, God's first creative act on the first day of creation was that of producing light. And, uh, and of course, that is so important. Before life can exist, there must be light. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Life comes from light. Jesus is the true light, the original light from which all light has its source. Remember what John wrote about the Lord in his description of heaven that we find recorded in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23. Speaking of heaven, it says, And the city has had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now back here in John's Gospel again, you find a tremendous series of contrast, detail between light and darkness. And of course in the spiritual realm, you remember that of course light is representative of God, Light is representative of eternal life, as we've seen this morning. 
Darkness, on the other hand, is representative of Satan and eternal death or separation from God. And so this is indicated here in chapter 1 in verse number 5. And the light shineth. Now let's do a little uh, grammar lesson here for a minute. And the light shineth. That's present tense, isn't it? And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. We still got a few minutes to go in spite of what's going on outside out there, so stay focused here. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. What's that saying? That simply means that the darkness is not able to put out the light. <laughs> and uh, you ever get yourself in a situation where, and I've been in some over the years where, uh, you know, where you just feel oppressed by evil you know the, I did a lot of prison ministry as I've told you before and most of the time I, I didn't even give two thoughts to it but I've been in some places where I just felt the oppression of evil the oppression of Satan in some of those places and I just had to have the Lord help me to be the testimony the witness that I need to be in that chapel service that day uh, to, to, to win men to Christ and uh, every now and then you find yourself in a situation out on soul winning where you're, where you're confronted with evil. And it may be in a, in, a, in a human form, amen? It may be in other forms sometimes. But remember that the darkness is not able to put out the light of your witness and of your testimony of what the Lord is in your life. Now take note of verse number 9 where the Bible says that Jesus Christ lights, uh, lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's speaking of a witness. That's speaking of the fact that, uh, you know, that <clears throat> of the light of the gospel and, uh, and, and other lights as well. And let me just cut it off right here. According to the scripture, there are several types of light that God gives to man. Let's do this very quickly here and we'll be finished this morning. First of all, there is the light of creation. The light of creation. The 19th Psalm talks about that. The handiwork uh, of God's handiwork in the universe. The light of creation. <clears throat> Secondly, there is the light of conscience. <clears throat> What's that? Conscience is the knowledge of good and evil which God has put in man. Conscience, the light of conscience. Conscience is the knowledge of good and evil which God has put in man. Let me give you a reference there. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27 Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27 the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord the scripture says searching all the inward parts of the belly and then thirdly of course there's the light of the gospel the light of the gospel all right let's stop there we'll expand upon that thought a little bit in Wednesday's session right after we do our memory work that's going to be our time for today all right thank you you are dismissed